Chapter Seven. All right, boys and girls, said Miss Plimsoll. It's almost time for lunch. Clear up your things. Paint pot securely closed, brushes washed, paintings unpinned and laid out to dry, drawing boards stacked against the wall. Ah, there's the bell. Front row first. Timothy leading, then Robin, single file, go. John, alone, walks slowly into the throng of hurrying along the corridors of the school cafeteria. The school is proud of the cafeteria and the food served in it. The room was spacious and bright, with windows all the way along one side overlooking the playground and the playing fields beyond. The opposite side was wholly taken up by the shiny silver service counter. Several boys and girls were already settled at tables by the time John took his place in line. Enviously, John noticed the boy nearby table sucked straws dipped in milk, a bottle that was dull with frost. John can imagine the refreshing taste of cold, creamy milk. On the other table, a group of girls were eating fat red cherries. John can almost feel the farm fruit in his tongue and the pleasure of biting through the tart, juicy pulp. The cherries must taste good. They must be thirst quenching. John unhappily took a tray from the pile and slid along the rails in front of the counter. He put a paper napkin, a glass, and a gleaming spoon, a knife, and a fork on the tray. It seemed hardly worth the while, but he felt he might as well try the food and drink. Perhaps if I eat a different way, without letting anything touch my lips, he muttered. My lunch won't change to chocolate. It was not very hopeful. What? asked the boy standing next to him. Nothing, John said. I thought I heard you say something about chocolate, the boy said. Hope this is the day for chocolate cream pie, he added. That'd be super. On chocolate cream pie days of the past, John had been known to skip the main course so that he might spend all his lunch money on dessert. The thought of four pieces of chocolate cream pie now suddenly made his stomach feel as though he were on a roller coaster. An uneasy, flibberty, gibberty sensation. John shuddered. Okay, he commented, wriggling up his nose. The other boy shrugged his shoulders and started to choose his meal. John took a plate of the cold chicken and ham, potato chips, and a crisp, moist lettuce and tomato salad. The white of the chicken, the pink of the ham, and the gold of the potatoes, pale green of the lettuce, and the red of the tomato looked delicious. He also took a half pint of milk, a thick crusted whole wheat roll, and a cool pat of butter, a tumbler of water with ice cubes clinking against the glass, and a dish of fresh fruit, slices of orange and grapefruit, and banana and grapes. John's tray wasn't loaded with just the sort of meal his mother would always John's tray was loaded with just the sort of meal his mother was always trying to persuade him to eat. Until today, John always thought it was pretty dull to eat the sensible thing when there were other sweeter foods and drinks to be had. Today, however, the sensible things looked most appetizing and his mouth began to water in its sticky way. John paid for the lunch with his money his mother had given him and went to the empty table and sat down. His fingers trembling slightly with eagerness, he cut off a slice of lettuce. His fork went through the leaves with promising crunch. He stuck the prongs of fork in his mouth, a mouth-sized piece of lettuce and carefully inserted it into his mouth. The lettuce didn't touch His wide stretched lips. John's teeth came together in a crisp layer of sweet chocolate. He took a small piece of potato chip, tilted back his head until he was looking straight up at the ceiling and dropped the morsel straight down in his throat. He felt it go down, a sharp fragment of sweet chocolate. He tried the milk, the ice water, the fruit. Every solid and liquid that sampled was transformed as soon as it entered his mouth. And then he became aware of a shocking novelty he hadn't noticed at breakfast. The rim of each glass, there was a small semicircle of opaque brown. The bowl of a spoon and the prongs of a spork had become brown. As John watched, horrified, the rarities of magic chocolate slowly spread until the last, the glasses and the cutlery were all solid chocolate. The trouble was unquestionable growing worse. John scalped tightly with fear. What am I gonna do, he asked himself miserably. Oh dear, oh dear, what is going to happen to me? Leaving his tray of chocolate food and drink and utensils, 
to unstumble the way from the cafeteria out onto the plate.